All right, talk about a hard time slot, right? They kind of teased you at lunch and then pulled it back and said, we have one more panel. So this, but I, I promise you, this panel is awesome. This is a fantastic group of people. I want to thank the conference organizers also for, if they're going to put us in this time slot, they gave us a great title. Did you see the title? It's Harnessing the Power of the People on the Move, Diaspora and Impact Investment. I think with all of the negative framings that so many of us are familiar with of migration and diaspora in general, um, it's, it's quite refreshing to, I think, have a conversation about positive directions um, that we can take the conversation. Of course, remittances are crucial aspects uh, of migration and diaspora financial contributions to their countries of origin. But diasporans, as we heard on the last panel, um, can actually contribute economically in their countries of origin in lots of different ways. They build assets, they invest in small and medium-sized enterprises, and they contribute to the development of their country of origin. Research shows that diasporans invest in their countries of origin for reasons just, not just to make a profit, uh, but also for non-pecuniary reasons as well. And so I think it becomes really interesting to have a conversation, therefore, about how do you really put together the best product portfolios to meet diaspora investment needs? And so we have a fantastic panel, I think, here to talk about these issues with us. Um, we're going to, I'm going to introduce them in terms of the order that we'll hear from them today. Our first speaker will be Frédéric Ponson, from, who is a, a remittance and financial inclusion specialist at IFAD. Ron Babakwa, who is the co-founder and managing director of Access Advisory. Lee Sorensen, an economic growth and private sector development specialist. And Lee Moran, the director for strategy, communications, and impact at Calvert Impact Capital. Frederick, if we could actually begin with you uh, first. Give us sort of an overview, kind of a survey of the very diverse landscape of the different products that are out there, the financial models that are out there to encourage diasporans to invest in their countries of origin. Thank you. First, uh, I would like to uh, mention that uh, through our survey at IFAD, we have um, indeed uh, assessed this philanthropic and uh, both philanthropic and uh, financial uh, interest of the diaspora to when they invest. This is a, a characteristic that is very specific to diaspora groups that those have to be underscored. And um, I think this is also uh, something that can interest the private sector, or at least as those uh, private players that are interested to, to propose some uh, investment vehicles that are at the frontier between uh, social impact and, uh, let's say, financial uh, return. So this is a, a very important feature of uh, diaspora investment. So now if we talk about, uh, look at the supply side, we have mainly four uh, models that are uh, uh, prevalent in, uh, in terms of uh, diaspora investment. If we talk about um, in financial investment, we are not talking uh, about uh, entrepreneurship, which is a different pattern of investment, which is, I think, uh, very promising, very challenging, that does have to be supported by donors because uh, in, in many circumstances, migrants are um, conveying innovation, are investing in, uh, in sectors or in value chain that are not uh, necessarily considered as profitable as uh, by uh, conventional investors. So that deserves interest for, for donors, for government, because that can help to reduce inequalities, uh, territorial inequalities, economic inequalities. So, but the, um, if we look at the investment uh, vehicles uh, that are available in, in the market, we have uh, mainly four, uh, let's say, models. The first, well, the first one is a diaspora bond. So we have an example with India in, uh, in Asia. So uh, recently we have uh, Nigeria that have issued a, a diaspora bond of uh, $300 million. So I think that gives a size of uh, the money that can be brought from the diaspora, these diaspora bonds, 
it was distributed mainly in the US um, to diaspora members and not non-diaspora members. So the, the main advantage, I think, to be to be distributed in the US was, or let's say, the, the, the key ingredient that allows to be distributed to retail investor was the fact that it was registered by the Security Exchanges Commission. And this is, I think, one key ingredient of uh, the success of this bond. Um, another type of, uh, another model is, uh, let's say, um, venture capital uh, investment funds, especially impact investment funds. So these vehicles that invest in uh, SMEs, in rural areas, or in uh, in, uh, in agricultural value chain, and this is this kind of vehicles we are looking at at IFAD because our mandate is to uh, improve uh, rural uh, population life. And through with these vehicles, we have two two types of uh, let's say um, possible collaboration with diaspora either as a shareholder, but this is a minority of uh, the cases, because we need to have the skill to be a fund manager and to have the capital also to, to be part of the, the governance of the fund. So it is quite uh, rare to have this, uh, this quality so that can work with business angel from the diaspora. This is a possibility. Another one is to sell some shares of these uh, investment vehicles to the diaspora, to individual investors. So that requires some uh, consultancy, some uh, uh, support from legal firms so that we can sell this, can transform this capital uh, in uh, financial products. So that was the case with uh, a Macedonian investment fund called SIF uh, uh, with the help of uh, uh, um, an investment platform called Homestream. So they were intermediating the selling of a share of these funds. Another example is uh, with the French uh, venture capital, which is called uh, Investisseur et Partenaire, which is partnering with a diaspora organization to also sell uh, a share of the capital. So the third type of uh, model is the crowdfunding platform that allows to to uh, intermediate, let's say, uh, diaspora saving to invest or to finance smaller businesses. We have an example uh, at IFAD, we are working with a, a crowdfunding platform called uh, Babylon, which is uh, linking uh, diaspora, the Mayan diaspora in France and uh, young entrepreneurs in uh, rural areas in, uh, in Mali that are supported by an IFAD project. So, this is uh, an interesting pilot project we are supporting. And that allows for uh, even, let's say, a uh, non-wealthy diaspora member to also finance someone in the village uh, with uh, uh, such an amount, uh, such a, a, a small amount as uh, 40 euros. So this is not only for, for the wealthiest uh, uh, segment of the diaspora, uh, this is quite interesting. And uh, the last model is, uh, I would call, a uh, hybrid models. We, we have developed at IFAD is working with the Somalian diaspora so that they can invest, uh, co-invest in, in uh, SMEs in the rural areas in Somalia. So the, uh, through, uh, let's say, um, a matching grant mechanism so that uh, allow to, to leverage financing from the diaspora. So, uh, we have raised uh, twice the amount of uh, the, the matching ground to reach uh, close to one million and a half dollars in investment in SMEs uh, in Somalia. And with this kind of, so, of uh, hybrid, hybrid uh, models, we've been working in the Philippines with an NGO called uh, Atika, which was working as a, a broker between the diaspora in, in different countries and uh, an agri-based uh, cooperative to buy preferred shares. So they were intermediating the, um, the buying of this share by the, by the diaspora. Thank you for that, uh, that overview. Now, Ron, let's talk, take this down to the actual regional level and look at the Asia Pacific region. Can you talk a little bit about some examples and adaptations in these types of models 
for this region in particular. Sure thing. Thank you. Uh, Access has been working with the support of EFOD since 2010 uh, to enable migrants to transfer money and save it and invest it back at home. Uh, we've just completed a three-year program with Filipino and Nepali migrants on that. I should say, though, that our target here was not the kind of diaspora who has moved permanently, relocated permanently to the U.S. or to Europe. Uh, we're mostly dealing with people who are workers who will uh, return home. We do find a desire to invest. That's the first thing. There is demand. The first priorities usually are to pay off loans, and not just the migration loan. Often people coming from uh, rural areas are paying off loans for their farms and businesses too. After that, taking care of the children. The first investment, to, sorry, the children's education is next, and then the first investment after that is usually in housing. Okay, and that has an impact on the ha on, on, on the local economy, and it has an impact on the family. But when we really talk about a productive investment, it's further down the line. It's a lower priority. They have higher things to deal with. And and I bring this up because when when you talk to the migrants that we speak to about investing, it rarely in their mind means a financial investment. It means investing in a business, their own, ideally, or in someone else's to earn money. They've had so few people offer them a financial investment to begin with that it's not in their mind or when they have quite often there's a bit of a scam involved and we've spoken to so many migrants who have been investing in something and found that they lost their money so there is demand but i should say that um, uh, it, at least in terms of the subsector that we speak to most of that is the idea of investing in a business either that they run or their family runs or someone else i bring the family in as it's very important uh, when it comes to the migrants, there are certain things that are needed, but the migrants have all kinds of demands placed on them. And so if you really want to encourage investing over the long term, I think you have to address those other things, which means reaching out to the family members too. They need savings, they need protection, and they also want to invest in business, and that burden tends to fall on the migrant, making it more difficult for them to save money and invest. Of course, when we talk about product adaptations, Things that, that typically when we talk about products at all, we have three areas. The, the features, terms, and conditions, that's the things like the interest rate and all the requirements, how it's delivered, and then the marketing and communication that goes along with it. So obviously, when we talk about the terms, terms and conditions, the key thing for migrants is that uh, they're unable to make large investments. They have to be able to save and build up their, their capital slowly in whatever investment. Uh, they Parking their money long term is difficult. It's very challenging to get people to do that. So that's why I always try to link, we try to link uh, long term investments with access to either flexible savings or emergency loans to cover cash flow shortfalls so that they're not uh, driven to uh, withdraw their savings. Delivery is very important as well. You're dealing with people who live in a foreign country uh, who are very hard to reach Migrants work six days a week, they have one day off, uh, and most of that time is spent relaxing uh, and maybe dealing with some personal things. So to get them to change their behavior is very, very difficult. Uh, ideally, what you want is the ability for them to be able to remit into an account, not a cash transaction. Uh, and that becomes extremely difficult because you're dealing with multiple organizations along a chain. Uh, whatever the remittance receiving agent is, the transferring operation, and then finally, of course, how it ends up into whatever account that exists. It tends to mean multiple pieces. And putting those pieces together uh, is an adaptation that it can be challenging. Cash transactions, it's very less, much less likely that money is going to end up in a, in, a, in a savings or an investment account. When you do these things, you also need to think about um, uh, balance inquiry and other communication, right? Someone is sending money from, uh, from say, Malaysia to Nepal. They want to know that money's there, right? They want to know when it arrives. They want to be able to access their accounts. And, and this, it seems obvious. I mean, this is, this is sort of internet banking, but uh, not all institutions that are trying to make, develop these kinds of uh, products and services have that communication uh, pro, uh, system in place. And then finally, uh, in terms of product adaptations. Uh, marketing is important. 
you know, there's how many times have you seen savings led or investment led programs where people open accounts, make a couple of deposits or investments, and then stop? It's very, very common. And the reason is that savings are nothing like loans. Loans, there's infinite demand for loans. And repayment is an obligation and necessary to get the next one. So there is an incentive to repay. Saving is a voluntary activity. Investing is a voluntary activity. And when, um, you know, when all the day is done and you've worked and you've received your money and you've gone out with your friends and your parents, your, sorry, your family members have asked you for money, what's left over is often quite limited. So you need to have, uh, in, in our mind, a uh, constant, repetitive, iterative approach to reminding people uh, that they have a savings plan and they need to save it. And this is where we embed uh, product promotion and financial education together to get people to develop savings plan, create in their minds a reason for saving. That's really important. Uh, and then maintain that savings plan. So all of these adaptations in terms of uh, adding on features, uh, making sure that the, the delivery reaches the doorstep and, and is convenient, uh, and marketing are all important. Finally, though, when it comes to actually investing, so we, we worked mostly on deposits. We got migrants to deposit money and save it at local financial institutions in the locations where they come from. We looked also at creating uh, investment funds. Uh, the, the challenge with investment funds is the underwriting. What does it invest in? You can choose, for example, stocks and bonds. That's possible. It's volatile, there's risk there. But also, it's not something that migrants, to some migrants, I think, you know, investing in, in the stock market is sophisticated. There's some interest there. But it doesn't really link their money to the local economy in the way that they want. If you try to create a unit investment trust, a mutual fund, something like that under normal laws in, in countries like the Philippines or Nepal, you will find, first of all, that you need a lot of people involved uh, by law. Uh, that will add expense and therefore reduce your margin. But most importantly, these kinds of funds are required by law to mark to market every day. That is, you have to show the value of this thing. And you can't do that with things that are not listed on the stock market or the bond market. So for us, traditional investment funds uh, were difficult to create that to, target, to, to link migrants and their remittances to local development. Instead, uh, what we did, uh, the, um, sorry, I've lost my place there. Uh, because it was, the, the option instead is to create a fund with people that go out and look for investments. Uh, they'll go to rural areas and look for MS, MSMEs to invest in, and that also is very expensive. Uh, in our case, we were very lucky to find a great partner in Nepal, Citizens Investment Trust. They are a uh, government-controlled corporation that acts as a pension fund manager and a fund manager for government employees and private sector workers, but also uh, for uh, self-entrepreneurs. Uh, self, uh, uh, and uh, they were willing to create a fund where migrants could uh, send that money in, and that money is being used to invest in rural projects like hydropower. Uh, but absent that kind of player, uh, in the case of the Philippines, we work with NATCO, the National Confederation of Cooperatives. They are not allowed to take money directly from, uh, from, their, from individuals, from retail. So the money was going to their member cooperatives and then put back up into NATCO to manage uh, through, their, uh, uh, through their network. So there are ways around the regulatory requirements. Uh, but ultimately, for us, what we found was the most effective and fastest way to create an, uh, an investment product for migrants was the deposit funds at local financial institutions that then intermediated into uh, farms and enterprises in their local area. That worked for us the best. Uh, but uh, even so, I, one last point I'd like to make is that, again, most people, if they're investing, they're investing to save money to use later on, not so much as a financial investment. And when we met these migrants, what we found is that they have this desire to invest in the business, but they don't really know what to do exactly, what business to invest in, what business to create. So I think the other adaptation that's really important here is not only guiding people in creating systems so that they can create a pool of money, but giving them guidance to use that money in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Those really good comments, I think, really talking about how the 
actual supply of these products really needs to meet the unique demands uh, of, this, of this market. <laughs> Lee, I'd like to turn to you to talk a little bit about the, all the different types of partners that one often needs to kind of bring to bear here. Ron sort of alluded to that in order to make any one of these products really come to life. Public sector partners, development agencies, other private sector partners, diaspora organizations. Can you talk about some of the challenges and opportunities of all these partnerships and these models? Sure. Uh, thanks, Liesl. Um, first of all, thanks for letting me be on this panel. It's a lot of fun to be at these forums. Um, I've been in a few. The conversation is always robust, and this is very exciting to see the advances, the technologies that are coming in to improve the environment. Um, my experience comes primarily from the Somali uh, context, and uh, there's perhaps not a better laboratory to look at the coming together of the stabilization, development, and migration nexus. Um, you have migration happening because of climate change. You have, of course, you know, decades of migration because of, of conflict. And you also have the economic migration that's occurring as well. And I would echo what's been said here previously uh, about um, Somalis uh, in terms of investment. They look at it more than just an economic investment or financial investment. Um, in fact, much of the country is the, the current president, uh, Mohammed uh, Ablahi Mohammed Farmajo is uh, a diaspora who's returned back and is now president. Uh, they occupy seats of government, um, they're bringing back technology and understanding, and they're also coming back with their capital and investing as well. So the question was about the kinds of partners that you need to leverage. In a context like that, where institutions are weak, the development partners are crucial, um, primarily to address the enabling environment issues. Um, uh, the World Bank uh, Group, IFC, has been very instrumental in, 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 in fostering a public-private dialogue to bring, of course, uh, about um, uh, conversations around protections for investment, protections for returnees, uh, those sorts of things, and also to um, create standards and, um, and, and, and encourage technical expertise. Um, as well, diasporans, when they're looking to return back, are overwhelmingly looking, they're, they're, they're at a deficit in terms of information, quality information. Um, data doesn't exist in a context like that, and so they can be uh, very easily exploited. Um, a lot of times they'll put money into investments that uh, are with family members or, or, or clan members or others that aren't necessarily good business propositions. And so information is very, very critical. Um, the exciting thing in the, in the, in the Somali context is um, diaspora have been giving back and wish to give back and are giving back and investing across the board. Um, they're, they're investing in, in renewable energy. I've done a fair amount of, uh, of work in renewable energy investments. They're coming back with technologies, operate solutions. Um, they're investing in health, um, nutrition, value chain investments throughout agriculture. Um, in fact, with Federica referenced earlier on, the um, the uh, EFAD back Somali, uh, the, the Agri-Food Fund, was a fund that we had managed through an, an initiative that I used to direct uh, a couple years ago um, called Scirocco, which actually we put together a neutral brokerage for, to basically create deal flow and, um, uh, in, in Somalia. Um, let's see. The, uh, let's see. Some of the challenges, some of the challenges, well, I brought that up. So the biggest challenges really are, are lack of formality, um, you know, being able to get money in. There are major issues, uh, everyone knows that uh, when you get into the de-risking situation, how it affected the Somalis uh, in terms of there's so much threat, of, you know, touching something live in Somalia. Um, but, it, but, you know, with 23 to 25 percent of their GDP coming from remittances, you can't mess with that. I mean, it, this comes in under a different way, you know, so um, uh, uh, that was a, a big, big deal. Um, so, I'm losing my train of thought where I was. Anyway, um, some of the challenges really is are on, on the formal flows, uh, in addressing the naval environment, um, information, and protections. And uh, the development partners, uh, we worked um, very much with um, CETA, the Swedes, on developing a credit guarantee scheme. Um, for local lending um, to provide uh, security and assurances through which then diasporans would come back and match and invest alongside as well. So anyway, very important. Thank you, Lee. Now turn to the other Lee on the panel. Um, Lee, Calvert Impact uh, Investment has, has, or Calvert Impact Capital has some really interesting, I think, case examples to share with all of us. I think that brings a lot of these themes together. Can you share a little bit about 
what your experience has been building these products and marketing them. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Liesl. And now I really am the last thing between you guys and lunch, so I'll go quick.